everybody, I'm Robert Donovan. Welcome to this episode of Not Treconomics. This show has always proceeded from the premise that Star Trek shows an advanced post-satiation economy and not its oft-mentioned post-scarcity economy. We live in a finite and tropic universe, which means true post-scarcity is impossible and therefore you have to speak in terms of relative scarcity, not post-scarcity. Within Star Trek, we also see that some scarcity does still exist in terms of latinum, dilithium, and real estate. We also see replicators, holodecks, and transports transporters functioning as physical capital, human capital, and in-kind income. Post-satiation simply fits that evidence better than post-scarcity does. Because it is post-satiation, I also assert that free markets can get us to a post-satiation society very close, if not exactly like the one in Star Trek, only better, with none of the inconsistencies we find in the show. And before we get into how I'm going to do that, I would like to talk about a few of the more prominent inconsistencies in the Star Trek economy that we see in the show. In this first clip, we have Picard expounding on the elimination of hunger, want, and the need for possessions. A lot has changed in the past 300 years. People are no longer obsessed with the accumulation of things. We have eliminated hunger, want, the need for possessions. We've grown out of our infancy. First off, the accumulation, the obsessed with the accumulation of things thing. The first time I saw this, my first thought was virtue signaling does not become you, Mr. Picard. And I'm not sure if this was an accident on the part of the writers and that they were clumsily trying to make Offenhaus appear to be this power-hungry jerk, or if they actually thought this through. But in story, Picard it makes sense that he would say the things he does because Picard was born into an advanced post-satiation civilization and therefore never had to worry about food, water, shelter, clothing, health care. Any worries about future supply would have been mostly academic and relative at worst, meaning he might miss a meal or occasionally go hungry, but he was never in danger of starving. In those conditions, it is easy not to obsess over the accumulation of things. And I find Offenhaus's reply equally interesting. You've got it all wrong. It has never been about possessions. It's about power. Power to do what? To control your life, your destiny. That kind of control is an illusion. And again, I'm not sure if this was the Star Trek writer's clumsy attempt to make him appear more superficial, but his reply does aptly speak to the difference between mindless consumerism and the which is the accumulation of things to which part Picard refers and with the motivation which Picard ascribes to him and the acquisition of resources to secure against unexpected future costs injuries and shortages which Offenhaus refers to as to control one's life or controlling your life nobody can control everything of course but to exert control over the things you can control takes resources. Picard has always had resources or access to them to do that, and never has he known the uncertainty of having to compete to acquire those resources through an exchange of economic value and trade. I suspect that were the positions reversed, Picard would act exactly as Offenhaus does, or has at least in his life. The other thing Picard mentions in this clip is that they have eliminated the need for possessions. Well, I hate to break it to Jean-Luc, but possessions are inextricably linked to and usually downstream of property rights. Absent at least a few legally defined and binding property rights, Picard's only recourse to stop somebody from just taking up residence in his house or on his land would be phasers on stun, or worse, depending on what the encroachers were packing. Cisco's restaurant in New Orleans, Kirk's high-rise apartment in San Francisco, same thing. Prime real estate locations are finite and they can't be replicated, so the no need to steal it because we can just replicate new ones argument does not work for those. In this next clip, we have what I call a discussion about the challenge of purpose in a post-satiation society. This is the 24th century. Material needs no longer exist. Then what's the challenge? The challenge, Mr. Offenhaus, is to improve yourself, to enrich yourself. Enjoy it. 
Here again, I think Picard is being a touch superficial. Self-improvement and self-enrichment are not goals. They are the result of accomplishing goals. In a world where there is no economic penalty for failing to improve yourself and barely any need for human labor, the far bigger challenge, to my way of thinking, would be to avoid the soul-crushing boredom and tedium of purposelessness. Space exploration, colonization of other planets, orbital construction, terraforming, scientific discovery, all the stuff we see on Star Trek are constructive ways to avoid that boredom. Addiction to drug, sex, and holodeck fantasies would be a less constructive approach. In fact, I suspect that were one to start a suicide and addiction counseling center on RISA, one would be very, very busy indeed. The final trope that they love to show in the world of Treconomics is the idea that money does not exist. Don't tell me they don't use money in the 23rd century. Well, we don't. Money doesn't exist in the 24th century. No money? You mean you don't get paid? The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. All right, now in the clip where Picard is talking to Lily from First Contact, I believe it's more accurate to say that the pursuit of pure monetary gain is no longer the driving force in people's lives. The pursuit of a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of adventure, a wealth of exploration and experience of meeting other cultures and exploring other planets is certainly a driving force in Picard's life, and I believe he would consider that a form of wealth. It also speaks to Offenhouse's idea that it's not about possession. Deep Space Nine takes this to a somewhat comical extreme. Come on, Knock. No, why not? It's my money, Jake. If you want to bid at the auction, use your own money. I'm human. I don't have any money. It's not my fault your species decided to abandon currency-based economics in favor of some philosophy of self-enhancement. Hey, watch it. There's nothing wrong with our philosophy. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. What does that mean exactly? It means, it means we don't need money. Yeah, Jake, what that means is that whenever any Federation citizen runs into a culture that does use money, the Federation is instantly reduced to barter or beggary. That's what that means. Well, if you don't need money, then you certainly don't need mine. <laughs> Amen, and you tell him, Nog. You're up, Barley. I thought writers slept late. Not always. I sold my first book today. Really? How much did you get for it? It's just a figure of speech. The Federation News Service is going to publish a book of my stories about life on the station under Dominion rule. And they're not paying you? No. Well, then you have my sympathies, and the first round of drinks is on the house. Really? No. It's a figure of speech. Yeah, the Ferengi may be the dumbest capitalists in the galaxy with their stupid rules of acquisition, but uh, they get a few things right, and you got to give them credit where it's due. Well done, Quark. It is simply not necessary to get rid of money to accomplish everything we see in Star Trek, including, by the way, the apparent lack of money. And to do it, I'm going to invoke those twin gods of resource-based economy and post-scarcity enthusiasts everywhere, artificial intelligence and automation. Not this kind, or this kind, or this kind, but rather the kind the guy in the next clip is talking about, this kind. See if any of what this guy says sounds like what we see in Star Trek. We have to save for retirement. We have to manage our money. Uh, and, uh, and we believe that technology in general is helping us to automate that work so that we don't have to do it anymore, which is ultimately what I think most people want. I think want. what we all want, at least what I want, is this future where I don't have to think about my money. Ultimately, I don't want to have to manage my paycheck and think about how much should be in my checking account versus my savings account. Right? I don't want to have to think about how much to put in my IRA or my 401k. Why doesn't my financial institution do that for me? We are like the self-driving car of financial services, right? We're going to get you there. Um, you tell us where you want to go. We're going to get you there safer, faster, better than you can do it yourself. Okay, for those of you that don't know who that guy is, it's John Stein. He's the CEO of the robo-advisor Betterment. Robo-advisors use computer algorithms to allocate assets at far lower costs and starting account sizes than human financial advisors require. Suppose we apply the 
Star Trek level AI to robo advisors such as Betterment, Wealthfront, Wealth Simple, and M1 Finance. Robo advisors are already outperforming the majority of individuals and financial managers without even having really sophisticated AI yet, though they don't yet outperform the broad market averages. That is a bit of an apples to oranges comparison because the robo advisors like Betterment are going for a completely passive investing and they're going for consistency of returns. There's a trade off there in that. To get those things, you are probably not going to be able to beat the broad market averages most of the time on the upside. The hope is you will not fall as far when the market goes down. Consistency of returns is probably more valuable to long-term retirees than higher returns, although reasonable men may differ on that point. But robo-advisors are at least doing pretty well on the upside, which is if they weren't doing that, there'd be nothing to interest anybody. The other thing about the robo-advisors is that they have the money and the incentive to develop highly capable financial AI algorithms to help you reach your post-satiation goals as fast as possible within your risk tolerances. The biggest plus to this type of system is that it preserves the information carried by prices. Now this only works if humans and not the AIs are making the buying and selling decisions, so let's get that up front right off the bat, but up and down price movement signals instantly and dynamically whether people want more or less of something now or later. AIs can aggregate that information and signal suppliers and producers, human or machine, what to produce more or less of. That back propagates along the entire production stream and drives the efficient allocation of resources. Absent price info, central planning economies that attempt to do this have had a nasty tendency historically to result in mass starvation. Now, AIs also have another, exam another advantage here doing this is that they exchange their exchange of buying and selling data provides a highly accurate measure of the value of goods relative to the money supply, which would enable them to create a highly stable fiat or cryptocurrency. So how long would it take to possibly get to something like we see in Star Trek if we did this? It depends a little bit on the returns the AIs are able to get, but let's uh, be a little bit pessimistic here. From 2020 to 2050, uh, you're talking about the early attraction would be convenience. This is happening already. As the AI improves in these things, their next attraction would be consistency of average annual return, I would guess. They'll go mainstream when the returns start beating or matching the broad market averages. Once that happens, it would not be a big stretch for people to be comfortable with them handling their paychecks, bills, savings, and investments. Uh, point of sale purchases would start being managed by these things automatically. It would be a case where you'd never see a paycheck, but you would always have money because the AI was basically just handling it for you. At this point, I would expect to see about 80% robo-participation. 40% of those people would be post-subsistence. 18% of those would be post-satiation. There would still be a few older Social Security recipients still alive receiving Social Security and probably not using one of these. You would also have always some segment of the population might prefer to manage its own investments I think that segment would start to get very, very small as they were unable to match the performance of the AIs, but that may take some time. You will have the occasional crash or prolonged market decline, slowing things down. AIs would be able to implement a smooth consumption algorithm fairly efficiently, which would tend to smooth that out, but it, that you won't see the effect of that until the majority of people are letting the AIs manage all their finances. 2050 to 2080 would be about when you'd start seeing that expansion. The financial AI, the robo-AI use would expand, more people would hit post-subsistence, uh, more purchases would start becoming transactions between AIs with no apparent exchange taking place between humans, because basically you just walk into a restaurant, say I'd like burger, fries, and a Coke. They say no problem, we'll have the drone or the human bring it to you, or you can pick it up over there. And you wouldn't exchange, there's no money, you wouldn't even take your ATM card out, your AI would just be, you would either have it on like your phone or your, your little nano something in your, in your jaw that recorded this, that talked to the AI. It would just happen. There'd be no cashier, there, wouldn't, there might be a kiosk, but the idea is that there's no exchange taking place in the physical world. It's all happening digitally. 
This is the point where money starts to become invisible. You just go get things at the store, order things online, get charged for the energy and materials used to 3D print or replicate items, which is how replicate, public replicators can appear to be public goods. Startup ventures would look like voluntary collaborations. This is the way you could pay for things like, you know, building the Starfleet Academy or building starships and spaceports. Um, the AIs would basically just be handling all the finances of that silently so that people would be free to concentrate on doing the best job. Systemic poverty starts to disappear when you get over 50% post-subsistence. And as post-subsistence approaches 100%, the AIs would start creating their own cryptocurrency, inflation would disappear, and living standards would start to rise very rapidly at that point. 2080 to 2010 would be sort of SpaceX for the masses era. Post-satiation would expand probably to 95 98%. Robo-AIs would handle 100% of everybody's finances and probably have been for a while. Most people are aware of money only abstractly. It's sort of like when you get into an elevator and go to the 40th floor. You walk into the little room, the doors close, you find the lighted button that says 40, you press it. A few minutes later, the doors open back up and you're on floor number 40. You don't, at any point, really give much thought, if any thought, to the, all of the systems involved in getting you to, for, to floor number 40 or preventing you from plummeting into the basement. This is kind of how people would view the use of money. They go into the store, they know there's a transaction going on, but they're completely detached from it. The poor in 2110 would probably very much be likely to live like multimillionaires today. The average person can afford, at this point, to invest in projects like orbital habitats, space infrastructure. Basically, everybody has enough money where they can go kind of collaborate with guys like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. They've got the cash to throw at this, and they don't. They've got all their other stuff taken care of. They've got enough extra cash where they could start really participating in stuff like this. 2110 to 2140, space entrepreneurialism goes mainstream. AIs are tracking transactions by nanosensors in real time as products change hands and services are performed. Poverty exists by this time, if at all, only in relative terms. 99 to 100% post-satiation. Space is the new destination for tourists and young entrepreneurs looking to make their fortunes. By 2140 to 2170, in-kind income starts to evolve because you're so de you know, no one has thought about money for generations no one has really had to worry or interact with money much if, if for a couple of generations now so at this point what you can do and who what you know and how your expertise and how productive you are at things would be the thing that impresses people. People haven't been impressed by money for a couple of generations by this point. And under those conditions, that's when you start to see the kind of in-kind income based on reputation, achievements, expertise, and productivity becomes a kind of informal derivative currency, the kind of thing we see in Star Trek. And so by 2200 and onward, the direct use of money, I think, would be exceedingly rare, still possible, usually involving places or planets that had either older AI that hadn't updated yet, or the rare physical auction, or maybe some place that was newly, in the Star Trek context, some place newly admitted to the Federation who had not been fully integrated into the system yet, such as Beverly Crusher charging a bolt of cloth on Farpoint Station, or the auction that was in the clip earlier where Jake wanted to bid um, on a baseball card on Deep Space Nine. So anyway, that's how I think we could get to something that looks very much like Star Trek, starting with a capitalist society and staying with a free market, monetary-based economy. And I would like to hear your thoughts on this. Welcome to my new subscribers. I've picked up a couple of more. That is awesome. I love you guys. I'm so glad and really amazed that anybody wants to listen to this crazy channel. So thank you all for subscribing. And thanks to my current subscribe, my you know, previous and current subscribers for sticking with me. More stuff like this to come. If you want to see it, please also comment, like, and subscribe. It really helps the channel when you do that. And until next time... May the balance of your day be awesome.